Now let's try, you know, we're supposed to be done with this uh, chapter for now, but we're gonna scan through it fast. So we did the for loop and today we're supposed to cover the if statement. We discussed before how the for loop is looking like. Then there is a mathematical way that I'm not a fan of how to find the number of times that the loop is executed. They're saying use the floor multiplied by last minus first divided by increment. That's in case your for loop look like this, like k equals first, then increment, then last. So instead of 4i equals 1 to 5, you have 4i equals 1, then column 0 0.5, then column 5. So every time you increment the i with a certain value, so you don't go from 1 to 2, you go from 1 to 1.5. So that's, in that case, when you have increment, then it's a little bit more complicated to trace. I don't know, I don't think I would do that to you, but it's good to know. Now, we know already the basics of four. When the for loop complete, the index contain the last value used. If the vector j column k or j column m, which is the increment, then k is empty, statement is not executed, and the control will pass the statement following the word end. And it's always good to have an indent or tabulate the statement inside a for loop. So you can notice that the editor does this for you automatically with a feature called smart indenting. I believe that's the step uh, button that you use, but in a coding way. Now there is some inline uh, single uh, loops. If you wanna do a for loop, you don't wanna go the next line and the next line, you don't wanna hit enter, you can do it in one line. It will look like this, for index, let's say i equals j to k, then semicolon, we said semicolon represent as you hit enter. So hit semicolon and continue whatever you want. You can continue in one line if you want to. So then you write your statement, then you end uh, the for loop in this case. Now for the if statement, how does the if statement look like? We said if statement, I believe for those of you who had some programming languages like Java as some of you took it, if statement help you to compare. Let's say I, want, I have a color red, blue, and white. Then if the color is red, I want to display number one. If the color is white, I need to display number two. If the color is green, I need to display number three. In this case, for loop doesn't help me. In for loop, I can say display red, five times, 10 times, 100 times, I can, like repetitive stuff. But if I wanna say distinction, maybe you had that in Excel, maybe probably some of you had that issue. You gotta create an if statement. Like let's say if my, like now in your gradings, I would say if the student mark is above this and under this, then it's A. If it's above this, under this, it's B, it's C, and so on. So MATLAB have similar thing to distinguish between stuff and how to display things at a certain condition. So that's what we call as logical expression. Sometimes we say if A is greater in value than B, display for me A is the greatest. If B is less in value than A, A is greatest, B is greatest, and so on. So that's called logical expression. You're trying to say who's larger, who's smaller, and if it's larger or equal or larger than, display a certain command for me or a certain statement for me, and so on. There is another thing to test for a logical expression. It's equal, equal sign. If I say if x equal, equal zero, I would say in this case, it means x equals to zero. Like test if x equals to zero. Now the if else construct, there is something else called if else. So you could say if a equals equals four, display the value of i, then end. Or you can say if a equals equals four, display the value of i. Now what if doesn't equal four? I can say else a equals equals two, display for me a is lower than i in value or something similar to that. So you can say either if statement and end it or you can say if else. Same again ab about your gradings. A between a certain range of mark that where you get A in grading system and B in a certain range of marks. I would say if A um, if, if the grade of a student is between, I believe, 90 to 100, then I would say display A. So the grade of the student is A. Else, if the value of, of, if the grade of the student is between 80 to 89, then display B, and so on. So based on the mark you input, I can tell if you get A, B, and C. Now we need to keep in mind that statements 
A and B that you see here in the construct represent one or more statements. So you can have more than one statement in every time you have a statement A or B. Like not necessarily to say if A equals equals four. You can say if A equals equals four, B equals equals three, display for me this value. Now, if the condition is true, statement A would be executed for the if else statement. Now, we said MATLAB will go from the first line, then go down to next line, next line, then he go to else, then he go next line, end. Now, if condition, then statement A is true, he gonna execute it, he will forget about the else. He will execute the else only if statement A is wrong. In many cases, else is optional only. You use it when you wanna get the best out of your uh, logical judgment that you're trying to do. Um, I'm trying to think. Okay, let's continue on this. So you can have as well one line, if else, no need to go hit enter and go like if statement one, end, or let's say else, then statement two, then end. You can have if condition, semicolon, statement one, semicolon, else, semicolon, statement B, semicolon, and end. We already know that, that with semicolon, you can write all the things in one line. Commas or semicolons are essential between various clauses. Else is optional unless you really need that in your application. End is mandatory. You got to have it. Without it, MATLAB will keep waiting forever. Your program keep looping and he could, he could hang because the statement didn't finish anywhere. Now we have as well the else if. If condition one, we have statement A. Else if condition two, we have statement B. Else if condition three, Statement C, else, statements E, end. So condition one could be tested, like you go from top down. If condition one is being tested, if it's true, then statement A will be executed. Then MATLAB will go to the next one. Else, if the condition one is false, MATLAB will check for condition two. So you'll never go to else if, else if, any of these, unless the first one was uh, not true. Now we have A equals three, B equals four. Now I wanna write F statement. If A greater than B, I want you to tell me A is the greatest. Otherwise, write down B is the greatest. So I start with if A is greater than B, then I would display A is uh, not the greatest, the larger value. Then I would hit end. That's the basic simplest form of F. Now, what if I want to say else? So I can I can write another F. If A is less than B. You can just make it the long way. Display uh, B is the greatest. So instead of A, you have B is the greatest value, right? Then you end. Or you can combine them together. You can say if A is greater than B, then display for me A is the greatest or the bigger value. Then I will tell him else if B is greater than A. So no if there, else, you just write down the next line, your statement. So if A greater than B, display A is the greatest value. Else, it's like you're telling else if B is greater than A. Now what I'm gonna do, if that's true, Display for me B is the greatest. Now we know that A is three, B is four. If A is greater than B, display A is the greatest. Else, if B is greater than A, display B is the greatest. On the display, what did you get? What are you expecting? Let's say you don't have a PC. What are you expecting? He gonna show you A is the greatest or B is the greatest? So since A is smaller than B, or B is bigger than A, greater than A, then he will tell B 
is the greatest. So for else if, if none of the condition is true, statement after else is executed, arrange the logic so that not more than one of the condition is true. There can be any number of else ifs, but at most one else. Else if must be written as one word. Uh, you need to always have indent for each group of statement as shown uh, for you previously. Now there's something else just good to know. I don't, I don't want you to to be pros in it, it's called nested ifs. What does nested ifs mean? It's an if embedded within another if. So now you say here, if A greater than B, instead of saying display, I can say before that, if A greater than B, and I, need, I have another condition inside, and if b is greater than 0, I want to make sure it's a positive value, then I'll tell him display, I mean, this whatever you want, you know? But in this case, you have two ifs. So if you're writing them line by line, then maybe you need two ends to close, uh, one end to close the first if, second one to close the second if. And for the for loop, by the way, for i equals 1, to 5 and for b equals 2 to 4 then you do blah 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 whatever you want then you say end that's for the first loop and end that's for the second loop the good about MATLAB now they give you color code so you know when you close parentheses when you close an if when you close a for just keep that in mind so nested if or nested for loop always means you are putting a for loop within a for loop or an if statement within an if statement. Now we're going to the next chapter, which is program design and algorithm development. We will cover the program design process, programming MATLAB functions, user design MATLAB functions. If I want to summarize this chapter work for you, remember when we had our constants and we created them as a dedicated program. So we can call back those constants like the G, Avogadro number, and all of those just in one simple sentence based on the name of the uh, script file name that you used. Then you can call them back and embed them in your design and in your code and be able to use them efficiently. And that's being done a lot in the market. When you're in automotive industry or other mechanical engineering related industry, you will see their codes are being done this way. Like in, in vehicles, you have, you will see like a big code. In that big code, they will give a comment out in there, like it's like maybe 30, 50,000 lines of code that's running this vehicle, which is your vehicle computer. But in testing phase, the code is in front of you. You can play with it and fine tune it as needed. So you will see traction control. Like there is a little script for traction control. If you click on it, then you go another 20, 30,000 line of code for traction control only. Then it would be like engine tuning. It could be like transmission smoothness. It could be like, you know, like every subsystem, every group in the company have their own code that they develop, either them or the IT, or let's say the programmers or the computer science students, or let's say employees who did that together. But all are adjustable whenever you see a problem or a code, a problem in their code or not efficient or slow, all that matters you can call back and report it for them and solve it. Now for the program design process, we want to learn, we touched base a little bit about it in our programming steps that we discussed last time, but like program design process can be identified in solid steps that are very general. So firstly, your program while you're coding should be readable and clearly understandable, assuming the guy who's reading it have enough knowledge to understand it. Then if changes are really necessary in your code to correct sign mistakes and the like, they should be easily implemented. So don't make a lot of nesting, don't make a lot of complications. As moving in the course, you'll understand what we mean. Then you add enough comments, what we said comment out or the percentage sign, add enough comments and references so that even though if you came back yourself a year from now to your script today, you are able to understand it and same thing for the other engineers. We said, you know, engineering is, is a process and things take time and uh, people retire and people else get, somebody else get hired. And you are small, having a small little piece of the code in a big team. So you make sure whoever comes after you or wherever you go, 
uh, somebody else can read that code and understand it. Even the best coder in the world, not necessarily mean he can read the code as it is. You gotta know how things are related to each other, you know? Like I could be a scientist in transmission and I know what's the, what's the gear ratio, I know what's the power output, but maybe you in your mind, it came the idea in your mind while coding for that transmission, oh, I need to call the power, like let's say gear shifting, I wanna call it uh, power change. What does that mean? You change the power of electric circuit, you change the power of, I don't know, the, the driver is giving different power or different engine. So you gotta be specific what you're doing doesn't mean somebody else who's a genius in coding can be able to tell because you are identifying functions and you can call him anything you want. You can call him in your name. Who knows what you meant by your name in that time? So just keep that in mind. And of course, file naming is an art. We said last time we identified G equals this, Avogadro number equals that, then we call it constants. Well, there is a lot of constants in this world. To be more specific and to be a good coder, and a good engineer who's using MATLAB, you gotta say what kind of constants are these, you know? So you can say physical constants, mathematical constants, you could say maybe, I don't know, automotive assumptions, anything else. So naming is an art, always be thoughtful when you're working on something serious that your naming makes sense of what you're representing. Especially if you're using one file or one script within another script within another script, so they're gonna make, make sense to each other and have the right amount of coding. Now, if you want to take the, you know, in the simplest way of how to uh, describe the program design process, it's the same as an engineering method, same as a uh, design engineering process if you study it in other course. Step one, you analyze the problem that you're trying to write a code for and solve it. Then you write down your problem statement. Maybe you comment out and write down your problem statement. Then you gotta lay down the processing steam, how you're gonna approach it, like identify the variables, variable A, B, and C first, then I wanna execute the for loop, then I wanna use if statement within it. You know, the more you describe it, the better. Then you're gonna as well design the step-by-step -step, uh, procedure in a top-down process, as we said, while keeping in mind that there's for loops that they act differently and else ifs and nested ifs and so on. Then for step five, you have the program algorithm, so you translate whatever you write or visualize into the language of the MATLAB. Then eventually you do evaluation, that's through running the code, run the code, make sure there's no syntax errors, no problems, no mistakes happening here and there. Or even sometimes you assign a value for a certain constant that's physical, it's not the real value, so you had different outputs. Gotta make sure coding-wise, physical, mathematical, all makes sense and even engineering-wise. And at the end, you just the application. You can create your script and uh, you solve the problem in an application way where you can come out with a certain output with enough description in the output to tell whoever using that software that the problem is being solved this way. Now let's have a problem of a projectile. In this case, we have um, an, a projectile that we need to calculate the flight of that projectile, which let's assume a golf ball. Now the golf ball is launched at prescribed speed and prescribed launch angle. How many of you know projectiles? Or how many of you don't know projectiles? Never got it in physics. Okay, that's good. So you have, as, as you know, you need to determine trajectory of the flight and the horizontal distance of the projectile or object. Uh, before it eventually hit the ground. Now we will assume that the air resistance is zero and the constant gravitational force acting on the object is in the opposite direction of the vertical distance of the ground. The launch angle is theta naught or theta zero. That's defined as the angle measured from the horizon or the ground plane. Now theta naught will be greater than zero and less than pi, less than or equal to pi over two and theta naught equals zero will imply a launch in the pure horizontal direction and theta naught would be pi over two. Now the G would be assumed to be 9.81, that's the uh, gravitational acceleration. Launch speed is V naught and it should be in the units of meters per second. Now the time would be for sure greater than zero and the time would be in seconds. The launch time would be, which we call it T naught, would be zero. 
and the distance traveled would be in x direction for horizontal and y direction for vertical. Now what we want to do, we want to determine the time that the projectile will take from the start of his motion until he hit the ground, and what is the horizontal distance traveled, which would be x in this case, and the shape of the trajectory. Then at the end, we will plot the speed of the projectile versus the angular direction of his vector. Then at the end, we will use the theory of mathematical expressions that describe the solution to the zero-resistant projectile problem to develop an algorithm to obtain solution to it. Here, we don't have a well-defined problem. It's just a generalized problem where it's going to walk you through the process of applying the program design process steps. So now that's first, we kind of identified the problem in more details by the first description. Now for step two, we need to come up with the mathematical formulas that describe the solution for the projectile problem. And uh, we have the launch angle and the speed. So the horizontal distance traveled from x and y equals zero could be represented as x max. So we said x represent the horizontal or the x axis, that would be 2 multiplied by v naught initial velocity squared, divided by gravitational acceleration constant, multiplied by sine theta naught, multiplied by cosine theta naught. Again, I want to stress here, we are just trying to go through the process how to translate a physical problem into MATLAB. We don't want to make it a physics course. Otherwise, we will take that and write it down as free body diagram and all those details. Now, the time from t equals 0 at launch um, for the projectile to reach the x max could be represented as t of x max to equal to multiplied by v naught divided by g multiplied by sine theta naught. And y max as well for the maximum altitude will be v naught squared divided by 2g multiplied by sine squared of theta naught. And the time of y max would be v naught divided by g multiplied by sine theta naught. And x in this case would be v naught from the uh, motion equations, v naught by t by cosine theta naught, y would be v naught by t by sine theta naught, minus g divided by 2 multiplied by t squared. Eventually, the v will be the square root of the uh, x velocity, I mean the x distance and the y distance, that displacement in this case. And the theta would be tan inverse of vy divided by vx. You can imagine the code here will be very long and complicated. Now, you need to define the inputs. So we have the equations. What variables we have? We have the V naught, and we have the G, and probably we have theta. Let's see. Yeah, you have theta naught as well as a required input. Now you ask the user input G, input V naught, input theta naught, then you need to tell me how many or what's the duration of the projectile from T naught all the way to the final time. At steps four and five, you make the algorithm and the structure plan developed so that you lay down the plan of how you're going to approach creating such code to solve the problem in a MATLAB program. And of course, when you're done, you would save it as an M file. Now, the code will look like this. I would be happy to give it to you as a text. Try to trace the code and trace his comments and see, does he have any constraint in his code telling you that the angle should be greater than, less than? That's part of uh, tracing the problem of the code. Sometimes it could be just a space, sometimes it's just a a prime. The best coders in the world go through what you're going through now. There's nobody who would just write a code and drop the mic and keep going. No. You got a hustle. That's part of the hustle. The more you know how to go to code, the faster you're going to find the issue. That's the only difference. So step number one, we take it byte by byte in case of complication. Let's make sure he defined the input variables correctly. So g equals 9.1, semicolon. That's great. v naught or v o equals input. So he's going to ask you for v naught or initial velocity. Then you're going to see in your 
output, what is the launch speed in meter per second? Some of you already saw that, so that's good. Then the theta note, th note, equals input. So he's going to ask you for input with a text above it. What is the launch angle in degrees? You already reached there, then you had an issue, right? Theta note, he have an equation here. He said he's converting from degrees to radians. Now theta note equals pi multiplied by theta note divided by 180. Is there any issue there? The issue I see, you got to input your theta note properly in degrees so that he can execute the next line. Otherwise, he's going to give you an error. So you can see here how he commented out defining the input variables. Then, you know, he defined G, V note, theta note, all the equations needed whenever need to comment out for the user to be able to plug in some numbers. As you can see in input for the second line and the third line, then you write the word input, then you need to tell what the user need to plug in to, to be able to understand what you need from him or what he needs from this program. Now you can see how he's asking you how to calculate the range of duration. He's splitting the code into different segments so that every time you're at a certain segment where there's an error, as you experienced, then you can at least know where to look at before you move forward. Then if you want to run the program together, hit on run if everything looks good. Then uh, here he need what's your launch speed. Launch speed or initial speed, I would say, 40 meters per second, 40. Then you can see V note 40. What is the launch angle? Theta note in this case. Let's say it's 45 degrees. Hit enter. Now he draw for you the projectile speed versus angle and the projectile flight path with a V note of 40 meters per second and theta note or initial angle of 45 degrees. Here we didn't write the code, but we copy it from your textbook but it's good to learn on how to trace the code, how to find problems. This code, even though it looks big to you, that's considered a small code. There is codes that go long, very, very long in thousands and hundreds of thousands of lines. That's where the chaos happen. So the more prepared and clear thought that you had, the more you add comments, the better for you and for the team working with you. Or even in my case, when you submit script for me, when you write your notes, that's easier for me and you to be able to read the code together. If I'm a pro in coding or in writing a code in a certain language, doesn't mean I can understand what you meant by assigning a certain function to do a certain thing. Unless you're using like generic textbook-based functions, then yeah, that makes sense. All right, back to our slides. Now, programming MATLAB functions. MATLAB will help you to create your own functions .m or M file script, as we talked before about our constant example, uh, you can create a certain MATLAB script to do a certain thing within your current program. You can uh, designate it for inputs and output arguments. You can do anything with it and call it back whenever you need it. Now there is a function called inline, inline object in uh, specific. Here we have Harmonic oscillators, if you ever took vibration course or in your, in your physics course, two balls connected together with springs and connected to a wall with a spring. Moving one ball will move the next one in what is so-called as harmonic, harmonic oscillation. It means like there is a repetitive motion happening here in uh, physics definition. If you move a ball, it's going to move and trigger the next ball and so on. Now, if you have two couple of harmonic, coupled harmonic oscillators, two masses connected to a spring on a smooth table, there is no table resistance or surface resistance in this case. Now, let's say um, the output of the system as a function of time is given in the formula h of t equals cosine 8t plus cosine 9t. Now, in this case... In MATLAB, to represent that, you say h equals inline. What does inline mean? Because I have cosine 80 and cosine 90. How to represent them together in one line? I use the format or the uh, 
I use the script or the code in line, open parentheses, and then you have the prime, cosine 8 multiplied by t plus cosine 9 multiplied by t, close your prime, close your parentheses, semicolon, then x equals 0 with an increment of 20 divided by 300 all the way to 20, semicolon, plot x and the function h of x, then add a grid for me. Now, if you do that, you're going to be able to see a plot similar like this. This is the oscillatory harmonics or the harmonic oscillation for the function cosine 80 plus cosine 90. Now, the variable t in the inline definition of h is considered the input of the argument. You are representing H in terms of T. It is essentially uh, to have T in this case to be a dummy variable which, where it serves to provide input to the function from the outside world. Now you can use any variable you want if you wish to. You can as well create functions of more than one argument with inline. As you can see here, FL equal inline, open parentheses, X to the power of 2 plus Y to the power of 2, then comma, I have x, then comma y. We plug in x as the value of 1 in this equation and y as the value of 2. Your answer should be 5 in this case. So that's how you make an inline kind of uh, formula or functions going all together with addition or subtraction.